Moses is the creator of Genesis. So Genesis is Moses' teaching notes that contains the promise of an exodus. In Genesis 1, 2, 3, this heaven and earth had not been created. You will see it. I will show you from the Bible. John chapter 1 verse 1. The light is the word. The word was with God. The word was God. So that light in Genesis 1 3 is Christ being. I'm teaching good. Dr. Abel Damina is the founder and president of Abel Damina Ministries International and CEO of Kingdom Live Network, a Christian satellite TV channel covering Africa, America, Canada, and parts of Asia. He's the senior pastor of Power City International, a multifaceted, multicultural, and multinational gospel center where thousands meet weekly to worship God. He's also the president of International Covenant Ministers Association, a body that provides covering and ministerial resources for ministers of the gospel globally. Dr. Abel Damina hosts the TV program Righteous Invasion of Truth on KLN Africa and KICC TV Europe, through which millions are being transformed across the world. He travels around the globe preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ with demonstration of power, and he is a prolific writer and author of several books, which include The Priesthood of Jesus, The Gospel Reign of Life and Immortality, Grace the Struggle Free Zone, and the God class, amongst others. He's happily married to Rachel, and they're blessed with three lovely girls, Jemima, Jazimel, and JL, the Triple J, who are blessed with a singing sensation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, with a standing ovation, I bring to the stage Dr. Abel Damina. It giveth understanding to the simple. We come with hearts that are ready to receive clarity. So I decree that your word comes with such clarity. Bodies and yokes are destroyed. Whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. Bodies and yokes totally terminated. At the end of this service, your people live here equipped, built up, edified, and Jesus is glorified. Thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together as we say these words. I am born of God. I am born of the world. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service... I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Can we give Jesus the greatest shout in this service? <laughs> Glory. Amen. You can be seated with your sweet smart self this morning. What a joy and an honor to still be with us. Right here at the Refined People's Assembly. I want to celebrate and appreciate and honor Pastor Daddy Ken and the leadership of this house. Can we celebrate them? <laughs> celebrate them, celebrate them. Thank you for having me come. Thank you for all of you. your labor and sacrifices to ensure that the people of God are fed, people of God are equipped, and the house of God is built, and, you know, the gospel continues to thrive. You know, we love you, man. Love you, and uh, together we continue to see Christ revealed all over the world celebrate him again thank you man praise god <laughs> hallelujah um we've been here for five days now uh you know uh my team with me i want to thank god for them pastor philemon always with me and uh, glad to be here with him 
You know, um, Dr. Gabriel is also with me in this conference, and uh, Pastor Fred, who pastors our campuses in Mina, Niger State. We love you, man. Glad to have all of you with me. Truly appreciate you. And we also have Pastor Pastor Ayimba, Pastor Gus Power, all the way from Abba. You know, praise God. The Keruguma. <laughs> We also have Pastor Uko with us here this morning from uh, Abak in Akwaibom State. We love you, man. Glad to have all of you here and all the men of God that are in the conference and in this service. We honor and salute all of you and appreciate your labor. Can we celebrate all the men of God that are here this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, in the first service, I told them that about my displeasure that since I got here on Wednesday, we left everything to come here to be with you. Because last year I gave you my word that um, we should do a conference where we take a number of days to just teach the word. And you all agreed. And I said, are you sure we should do it? You said, yes. I said, will you make sure you're all here? You said, yes. Will you make sure you bring everybody in this city for me? You said, yes. So I gave you dates out of my non-available dates. And we made the sacrifices, all of us. We moved ourselves to Bayelsa since Wednesday. And half of you in this church have not been in the meetings. You broke the agreement. But I kept my part. See how serious you are. See? And it's not a, an overnight program. It's something we talked about since last year. So yesterday I was just thinking that... Um, the way some of you are on serious, maybe I shouldn't come for no limit as a punishment for your unseriousness. Maybe we'll come back again next year, 2023, so that you can use one year to learn and grow. Because, I mean, we've been here. <laughs> if you know, <laughs> if you know the things I left in Akwaibom to be with you here for five days, you have no idea. You know, so the only joy I will get for making the sacrifice is that you were here to get everything I came to teach. Otherwise, there's no other joy now, nothing. The joy is that you were available for me to teach you. But some of you never take it serious. I mean, a number of you that I see were here throughout, you know, and I thank you for making my stay worth the while. But I didn't come for just a number of you. I came for all of you in this church. You know, you have to... You have to really, you know, prove to me that you're very serious so that we can think about what to do at no limit, you know. You know, no limit can happen without me. I'm not that too much. Yes, it can. True. It can happen, you know. Um, but you really have to behave. Some of you have to really behave, you know. You can't be in a word church and not take the word serious then you'll be making us go forward and come back. Go forward and come back. Because we will teach things, and instead of going forward, you'll be dragging us back, asking unnecessary questions, which you wouldn't have asked if you were in the services. And the whole mission of this church is to grow you up. The reason why I came here for this number of days is to grow you up, is to add to your life, to bring value to you. And that's why we all came. That's why your pastor is spending all the money Keep us in hotels, pay for hotels, give us food, give us everything. You know, um, all the diesel that is being born in the services. It takes hundreds of thousands in every service. What of diesel? Hundreds of thousands. Because I we run generator. We don't use light in our church. We use generator for everything. Even our TV station that is 24 hours is generator we use throughout. So I know what diesel cost is per day. By every day, you know how much you spend on diesel. So for us to have spent all this much money, and then you're not here to get what we came to teach, it's really not worth it. You know, you've got to really repent. You've got to behave. And even when I'm not here, you have to treat your pastor with a lot of value. You have to take the word of God serious. Please, this is very important. You know, um, I'm a spiritual father. I'm not just a guest speaker. And if I see something that isn't right, it's my responsibility to correct you and to make you do what is right. If you agree, say, I hear you. Yes. you know, so turn to your neighbor, say, if you are the reason for this rebuke, 
behave yourself. Don't be a minus to me. You are supposed to be a plus. I didn't hear a good amen. Are you excited? All right. So I'm still watching to see if there will be fruits of repentance. You know, and if I see, then I will change my mind and then plan to come. You know, because usually your pastor insists that during No Limit Conference, I must, I must kill my weekend in Bielsa. I must stay from Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And those are the most important days for me. I can give you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, self. even Friday morning, I can dash you. But Sundays. But, you know, let's see. Amen. Are you blessed? Even with the rebuke. Are you blessed? All right, very good. James chapter 1, verse number 13. Let's get in the word. Uh -uh. James chapter 1, verse number 13. We've been looking at why things happen the way they happen. This morning, uh, you know, in this second service, I will try to push it somewhere. Then I will press a pause button and leave it for another time. Because I told you the other day, I really can't finish this. It takes, what I'm teaching you here, takes me like months to teach back home. It's a whole series because there's so much to unpack, so much to explain. Because we are actually dealing with creation. We're dealing with God's purpose. We're dealing with things that have happened before our great-grandfathers were born. We're dealing with realities that are superior to our age. So it takes time to calmly put them in place. And we're dealing with things that you have already assumed. People have taught you contrary to some of these things. So you have a mindset. And then we're bringing a new reality to alter what you already knew. So it takes a bit of time. And it takes a lot of patience to arrive at an understanding of all of these biblical concepts. But the truth is, once you're established in the truth of the gospel, you no more be confused about the character of God. So James chapter 1 verse 13. Let no man say, when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. Next verse. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Did you observe? Drawn away of his own, not Satan's own, of his own lust and enticed. And when, and, 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 it, and enticed, when lust had conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So man is the reason for sin because of his desire. The terminal end of sin is death. So God never created death and God never created sin. How do we know that? Genesis chapter 1 verse 31. Genesis chapter 1 verse number 31. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. Everything God made was very good. That means sin is not the making of God. That also means Satan is not the making of God. Because everything God had made, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So as at the sixth day of creation... Everything was very good. On the seventh day, God was resting. So that means after that seventh day, God has not created anything else. Because he entered into permanent eternal rest. Because he has finished all he wanted to do. Anything you see on earth today, there's nothing new. It's all as a result of what God had created in Genesis chapter 1. Then chapter 2, God formed man. Look at Genesis chapter 2 verse 1. Genesis chapter 2 verse number 1. Genesis chapter 2 verse number 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. Verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his walk. He ended his walk, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day, from all his work which he had made. Next verse. Pay attention. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Next verse. 
These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made them, the earth and the heavens. Next verse. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. Verse 6. Observe. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So there was no rain. God's plan was that the earth will have a self-irrigation system where water will be springing from the ground and watering the ground so that seed and plants can grow. No need for rain. Now, observe the next verse. And the Lord God formed man. The Lord God formed man. Now, remember, this is an after-event account. What did I say? After-event account because when this happened, Moses, who wrote it, was not there. Where was Moses? Moses had not been born. When was Moses born? Exodus chapter 2 verse 2. So if Moses was born in Exodus, Genesis had finished. So Moses wasn't here when all this happened. Therefore, it means that for Moses to be able to narrate these details, it was a third party account. What do I mean by third party account? Number one, God gave Moses a vision. He saw a vision of how all of this happened. That's the first thing. Secondly, Moses had some historical communications by oral tradition. People that were there or people that met people who met people who met people who were there. Okay? In fact, even Joseph was among those who documented things because history tells us that before Joseph died, he wrote a historical details because Joseph was intelligent and he was in Egypt. So he had a lot of data. He wrote a number of scripts and told them, when I die, carry my bones with you. Along with the bones of Joseph were his documentations. So when they went to Egypt with Joseph's bones, along with that were, were documentations of things that had happened. So some of those were part of what was put together to form the Genesis account of Moses. Are, are you still here? So it means there are for two different or three different sources of Moses' information. Number one, the vision. Number two, oral traditional the tradition that was used to communicate. Now, so when Moses is writing, he's not writing as one in the event. He is writing as one whom all the event has happened. Now he's looking back to document what he has seen. So the writings of Moses will not be totally sequential. It will not be totally sequential because it's not like day one, this happened. Day two, this happened. Apart from the creation account. After the creation account, every other thing will just be according to how he's able to remember the vision and put together what was documented. So now it will take revelation knowledge to unveil and unpack what Moses communicated from the vision and from the oral account. If I'm communicating, say I hear you. So when Moses is now saying that the Lord had not caused it to rain, what Moses was simply saying is that all of this period, rain has not fallen yet. Then look at it, it says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. But yesterday I told you that the Lord God did not form man as per God molded clay. Because if God had molded clay from the ground before breathing into it, it would mean that God created a dead body first. Because body without spirit is dead. And God does not create death. God only has life. So what must have happened in Genesis was that God breathed. And I told you the breath is not... The breath is God spoke. Because the words are speak, they are spirit. So God spoke the spirit of Moses out. And when God spoke the spirit of Moses out, the spirit of Moses hit the ground and took up a body for Moses. Now, that's exactly what happened in the creation of Moses. But uh, Moses is now, I mean, of Adam. But Moses is now writing as an after-event account. So the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So man is created in Genesis chapter 2 
to oversee what God has created in Genesis chapter 1. Then in chapter 2, observe something that is very instructive in verse number 15. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Next verse. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, please pay attention, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Next verse. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now Adam didn't know what it means to die because nobody has died before. So when God was saying, shall surely die, he didn't register because he doesn't know what it means to die. All right? Death is very deep for Adam as at that time. Look at the next verse. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Next verse. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So Adam at this point was functioning in full authority as the one managing the earth. So he could name all the animals and he could function in that authority. But in chapter 3, we see the fall. All right, the fall of man. Adam and Eve sinned against God, rejected what God has told them, and because they rejected what God has told them, it is called the fall. Unbelief or rebellion to God's instruction. That is the fall of man. So James now says, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. Next verse. James chapter 3, verse, I mean chapter 1 verse 14. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own loss and enticed. Watch the process now. Then when loss had conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Next verse. Do not err, my beloved, bro, my beloved brethren. The word err is the word plan O. Do not be led astray. And some, most times, that being led astray is a function of teaching or information. Can I have a good amen? So God gave man a will to choose. And man, Adam, chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Adam died or Adam was separated from God. Remember, death happened to Adam instantly. And that death was separation. So, the fall of man was separation. The death of Christ brought reconciliation. Man's fall, separation. The death of Christ, reconciliation. Alright? And that reconciliation is what brought life to man. Can I have a good amen? So, when Jesus said, in the beginning, it was not so, but Moses allowed you because of the hardness of your heart. That means... For sin in humanity, Moses allowed it. Moses allowed it. Why did Moses have so much power? Why did Moses have so much power that God said no divorce? And Moses said divorce. What gave Moses such power? That Moses can establish something that contradicts God and it is allowed. Have you thought of that before? What gave Moses such power? Israel gave Moses that power. Israel gave Moses that power. Remember, in Genesis 1, 26, 27, he said, let them have dominion over the fowls, over the birds, and over every living thing. The dominion of man is not over another man. No man has dominion over another man. God never created that system. Man only has dominion over fish, over cattle, over animals, and things that move upon the earth. That is the limit of man's dominion. But why is it today that men are ruling men? Why do we have governors? Why do we have presidents? In, in fact, there are some men of God who have the job of prophesying who will be the next president, next governor. 
which is not scriptural. Those are just soothsayers and diviners. Jesus never prophesied who will be a president or governor. Never. No apostle did it. Never. Because it's not scriptural. Yes, because human government is not the will of God. Write it down in capital letters. Human government is not the will of God. Because in the beginning, it was not so. God never designed for man to rule man. God designed for men to rule the planet. So why do men rule over men? Because God said through prophet Samuel that I want to govern my people in my own system as God. But Israel said to God, we don't want your government. God, do not rule over us. We want to be like other nations. So men rejected the government of God. So Samuel was angry and he came to God and God said, Samuel, if they reject me, I cannot rule them by force. I am God, I don't force things. Let them have what they want. So God permitted for men to rule men. But that's not the plan. If God give presidents to countries, <laughs> some of the people we have as presidents will not be in that office. If God gives governors to states, some of the governors we have should not smell government house. God is not in it. It's called human government. Yes. No matter the prophecy, you can never be a governor in a state if you don't belong to a political party. Yes, sir. That's right. Okay? Okay? And even if you're in the political party, you must have the support of the party. Because the party must give you their, their ticket. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That party is not God. <laughs> and even in the party... You cannot really win election until you have the structure support. And the structures are owned by kingmakers. You must service all of them. People come to me and say, Dr. Damina, should I run election? I say, ah, are you asking me? Do you want to run election? Yes. Do you have structure? That's the first thing. How wide is your structure? Do you have support of the, the principalities of the structure? <laughs> How long have you serviced the party? When you have supplied me all those answers and they are correct, I will tell you, okay, run. If your answers have K leg, I will say, bro, wait small, work some more. It's not a matter of close and do says the Lord. No, 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 no. Because that's not God's government. Look at what God said. He says, Samuel, since they have rejected me, tell them that the people that will be governor over them will use their daughters as cooks, will use their sons as horsemen. That is, they will employ their daughters to be cooking and use their boys to be baking and they will employ their sons as PA to the governor. The governor can have 20, 40, 50 PAs. Then they will take their young men and put them on machine called expert rider. And others will be in pilot car and others will be in escort cars. They will use them. That is human government. So they will use their children as slaves. Because that's the government of men. That's not the government of God. It's not God that created countries. Nigeria is not God's country. 1914, Nigeria was decided by some people who thought they can benefit from Nigeria. England is not God's country. Unbelievers, because light and darkness cannot stay in the same house. 
So if you now open your eye and marry unbeliever, your father-in-law will visit. His name is Satan. Because every unbeliever is a child of Satan. Satan is the father of unbelievers. I'm teaching good, right? Then the Bible says in marriage, do not make friends with an angry man. So if you're going out with a guy who speaks in tongues, but when he's angry, he can break television. And you see the anger, and you still marry, they will use your head for stew. No, God is not involved now. God already told you, when you want to marry, look for this, look for this, look for this. I'm your father, oh, but the choice ultimately is yours. Don't make friends with an angry woman. Woman that when she's angry, she can pour you stew. She's drinking Martina, she will pour it on your head. Let me give you one secret. Can I give you one secret? Can I give you one secret? If you want to marry, eh? don't use the way she's behaving towards you to know whether she's a good girl or not. And don't use the way he's behaving towards you to know whether he's a good boy or not. Because two of you are pretending. Do you know that you can pretend for 10 years? Very good. So since we can pretend for 10 years, how do I know correct woman? Look at how she treats others. The way she treats others is a revelation of her true character. pretending which means when you finally marry her the way she's treating others will become your permanent treatment if i'm teaching good say i hear you S sit down first sit down first sit down sit down first sit down first you marry woman she pursue your brothers Pursue your mother, pursue your friends, pursue everybody. Uh -uh. You marry man, your mother no get respect. Your mother no get respect. Now marriage without one. If your family bad like that, how they come produce you way good? And so your, your family are all witches. Now only you know the witch. Yet now from that family you come out. Something no balance. He balance. He get why I talk like that. <laughs> Somebody shout glory. God, why did you allow me to marry this woman? It's not God though. In fact, when you are going to marry, God was telling you, mm, 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 mm. You, you interpret them as, mm, mm. <laughs> you people are tempting me to come and do marriage conference. So. so, when it has to do with the choice of marriage, you don't blame God. When it has to do with the choice of government, you don't blame God. He allows all of that within the confine of man's activities. But he gives you guidelines to help you. He gives you indicators to help you. For example, he says that a man that is given to alcohol is a foolish man. Because alcohol makes you a fool. So you want to marry a brother who is still hiding big stout in the fridge. Every time you go visit her, you go see big stout inside fridge you want to marry a fool because a man that drinks alcohol the bible says he's a fool wine is a mocker it will mock him very soon he go drink drunk removing throws out through away he say ah madam see your husband though. that's a fool there are indicators like that there are indicators like that. Anger, whether man or woman. Alcohol, whether man or woman. Are you following? Yeah. And there are many parameters. The Bible already shows you. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You already know that. 
So if you now go and choose a woman that is not born again, that you're not sure she's born again, you yourself use your hand to bring trouble into your life. So you can't blame God for it. The same thing with elections. Because from the beginning, God had a standard. The standard was for men to rule over the earth and God rule over man. God never designed for man to rule man. He designed to rule over man while man rules over the earth. But man rejected the government of God and selected the government of men. Is it clear? So that's why governments behave the way they behave. When they want your vote, they will be your friend. They will come to your house. They will stop by Bayelsa Road and buy corn and be eating corn on the road and behaving as if they are part of us. Then once they enter power, Siren with Koboko will clear you of the road. Fear! Come out for road. Fear! 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 Emperor is coming. <laughs> I know I'm teaching good this morning. God is not responsible. It is the election and the government of men. Now look at something else I want to bring out quickly. Because yesterday somebody asked me a question. That in the genealogy. You follow that question? In the genealogy of Adam. Why was the name of Cain and Abel omitted? And I gave you the answer. But the person still keeps keep sending the answers online. Dr. Damira, I'm not satisfied. You say Cain did not produce after his kind. But the Bible says Cain produced children who built cities and towers. Now, Cain did not produce after his kind. Abel, the same. What was Cain's kind? What was Cain's kind? The Bible says Cain was of the evil one. So Cain persecuted Christ. He killed Abel to demonstrate his hatred for Christ. Because Abel had faith in Christ and by that exposed Cain. And Cain, out of anger for being exposed not to have faith in Christ, killed Abel. So that means Cain was an enemy of Christ. Means he was anti-Christ. So that removed him from the genealogy. And of course, Abel died without reproducing. So both of them are missing. And I will show you why. Genesis 4.26 Genesis 4.26. Observe. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Observe. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So Seth, which was after Cain, they all called on the name of the Lord. Abel called on the name of the Lord. The only person that rejected the name of the Lord is Cain. So that removed him from genealogy. Observe Genesis chapter 5. Pay attention. Genesis chapter 5 verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man. In the likeness of God made he him. Look at the next verse. Male and female created he them and blessed them. And called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Next verse. And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years. And begat a son in his own likeness after his image. And called his name Seth. So the genealogy of Adam started with Seth. Cain and Abel didn't exist. They are not part of that genealogy. Because first, Abel was cut off. And Cain was of the wicked one. Cain was actually Satan's representative. He was a type of Satan in the family of Adam. When he said he was a murderer from the beginning, you remember in the first service? That murderer from the beginning is Cain. So Cain was Satan in typology. And Cain was the destructive arm of Satan's ministry. The first murder in history was Cain. Then the Bible tells us it's not Cain that murdered. Satan was a murderer. So it was Satan in Cain. So Cain took Satan, a 
as his originator. So Cain was a direct descendant of Satan, not of Adam. I'm teaching. Because this is where Adam's generation started. Set. Next verse. And next verse, brother, verse 4. And the days of Adam after he had begotten set were 800 years. And he begat sons and daughters. Next verse. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Next verse. And set lived 105 years and begat Enos. See that? Abel and Cain not existing in that genealogy. Because Satan had started operating in humanity through Cain. And Cain was anti-Christ. He hated Christ, hated the gospel, hated the word of God. Such that anybody that represented the word of God, he killed the person. And the thief comment not. But for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's why Roman, John 8, 44, look at it. John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus now speaking, because this is Jesus in John 8, 44. Jesus said to those Jewish people, you are, put it up, brother, John 8, 44. <clears throat> John, no, John, yeah. You are of your father, the devil. You are of your what? What is father? Source. So, if the devil is their father, it means they are of Satan. You have your father the devil and the loss of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Observe. And abode not in the truth. Why? Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. So the fatherhood of lying started with Cain. Now, listen. Lie here it's not that I took this envelope and Pastor Daddy can say who took it and I say I didn't take it. That's lie within human beings, but that's not the Bible lie. Lie there is not lying like, like an act of lying. Lie there is to deny the existence of Christ. That's the lie. That's anti-Christ. Anti-antibiotics. Anti. Anti. Huh? Anti-Christ. Against Christ. Anti-corruption. Hmm? Uh, see, anti-Christ is not a big word. It's simply anti and Christ. Is to be against Christ. How can you be against Christ? By rejecting what Christ has done. So there are pastors who are anti-Christ. Because on their pulpit, they deny the work of Christ. They exalt human works. Those are anti-Christ churches. See, anti-Christ is not a man. Anti-Christ is a teaching. You can sit inside a church and they are teaching you think you are inside a church but you are consuming things that make you a doctrine. a doctrine that denies the divinity of Christ and denies the humanity of Christ or both. So if you know a church that does not believe that Jesus is God, that's antichrist. If you know a church that does not believe that Jesus was a human being, that's antichrist. If you know a religion that does not believe that Jesus is God, that religion is antichrist. So antichrist is not a man that will take over the world. Antichrist is a teaching. There's no human being that will be called the antichrist. The Bible doesn't call it the antichrist. The Bible calls it antichrists. against against Christ against the humanity of Christ against the divinity of Christ rejecting that Christ is God is a spirit at work 
Are you following? Please, if you're following, say, I hear you. So, Antichrist is a spirit that lies by denying the existence and the operation of God. Either in the flesh or the existence of God in the as, as, uh, existence of God as Christ in the spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 45. Uh -uh. 1 Corinthians 15 45. As it is written, everybody, I want us to read together like a mass choir. Everybody, want to go. The first man, Adam, was made what? And the last Adam was made what? Question. Hold on there, brother. We will soon move to verse 46, but stop at 45. Who was made a living soul? Which Adam? Eh? Which was made a quickening spirit? So there is first Adam, and there is last Adam, and the two of them are not the same. Okay? One is soul, the other is spirit. Are we together? Next verse. How be it that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. So hold on. First Adam, living soul. Last Adam, quickening spirit. Which of them is spiritual? Which is what? Quickening spirit. Which of them is natural? Which is what? Living soul. So there is Adam first, living soul, natural. Last Adam, quickening spirit, spiritual. I'm teaching good. I, I know I'm teaching good. Next verse. Next verse. The first man is of the earth. So babies don't come from heaven. Because the first man was created on earth. Where was the first man created? So, by, by the law, by the law of Genesis, after his kind. So, if the first one was created on earth, where will the mass ones be produced? So, where do babies come from? Earth. Is it getting clear? The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord. So who came from heaven? Jesus. Where did Adam come from? Earth. So all human beings, where do they come from? Earth. But when you are born again, where do you come from? Heaven. Are we teaching good? When you are born again, you are born of the spirit. So you originate from heaven. But when you are born natural, you are born a living soul. Say soul. soul. Say it again, soul. soul. You know, soul and spirit are so together that it's difficult to distinguish. You must know the Bible well to know the difference between soul and spirit. Because the only thing that can divide the soul and the spirit is the word of God. Otherwise, they are too interwoven. But observe this. He didn't say the first man is spirit. He said the first man is soul. That means if a man dies without Christ, he is lost forever. Okay, watch. Goats have soul. Chicken have soul. Eh? Fowl have soul. Fishes have soul. A man without Christ have soul. All of them are in the same class. What makes a man different from animals is when he receives the spirit of God. You didn't hear. You didn't hear me. You heard me. You didn't hear me. You know, when you kill chicken and fry, that's the end of that chicken. Eh? Because all the chicken has is what? Is so. When you cut fish and fry, that's the end. When a man without Christ dies, 
doesn't. The guarantee for life after life is Christ. No Jesus, no life. That's why the second, the second man is the Lord from heaven. So there are three men. If you're paying attention, there are three men. There is the first Adam, there's the last Adam, there's the second. See, the Bible words are not carelessly used. Are you following? Okay, look at it. The first man is of the earth 80. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Go back to the previous verse, 46. How be it? That was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual, 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So first, last. Then in verse 47, we saw second. Second man. So there's first man, the second man, the last man. Don't say no, second man is last man. Eh, eh. They don't teach Bible like that. If second man is last man, they will use second. They will continue to use last. There's first man, there's first Adam, last Adam, then second man, not second Adam. There's no second Adam. There's first Adam, last Adam, second man. First Adam, Eden. Last Adam, resurrection from the dead. Second man, the incarnation. The incarnation is not Adam. The incarnation is a miracle. The first man, there's a process. The last Adam, there's a process. But it is the second man that gave up himself for the last man to be produced. So first man, Adam, sinned and died. Second man came died. Last Adam came out of the death of second man. Listen. Second man, only begotten son. Last Adam, first begotten among many brethren. You're not following. Are you following? First Adam, sinned and died. Second man, Second man, the incarnation, the only monogenua or the monogenes, the only, nobody else like him. But he, that's not the plan. The plan was not to produce somebody that nobody is like. But the only way others can be like him is for the second man to die. So in death, he rose to must produce the last Adam. You know what that means? You are the last of God's creation. After the born again man, God will not create anything else. Are we getting clear? So, natural people are born on earth. Spiritual people are born in heaven. So, you don't make heaven at last. It is calm. You make heaven at first. That's where you are born. You are born in heaven. The born again man is not in, on, in a journey to try to make heaven. The born again man has made heaven. And he's living out that heaven reality on the earth. And when this earth is over, he continues in heaven. Am I teaching real good? If you're understanding, say, I hear you. All right, sit down. Where? Do babies go after they die? Should we go there? Yes, 
before where they go when they die, let's examine. Are babies born sinners? When babies are born, are they born sinners? The reason for this question will be Romans 3.23. Put it up. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3 verse 23. Let's all read together everybody. Want to go. For all have sinned. You're not talking to me, refined people. Let's go. One to go. What is all? What is all? Does it mean everybody? Eh? Uh -uh. In English language, what is all? All is all now. Nobody excluded. So all have sinned. Is that true? But have all really sinned? Why did you say no? <laughs> you won't fight Bible. <laughs> Bible has told you all have sinned and you're saying no. <laughs> it didn't say most people have sinned. It's all. Okay? Now this is what makes Bible interpretation sweet. Because when you say a verse like this, and this verse punish me seriously. Because they were preaching it in my church every Sunday. All I've seen, all I've seen. I confessed sin till I didn't find anyone to confess. So I created one. Both the one I've committed and the one I've not committed. I'm sorry. Because there's no more sin to confess. How many of you were in the same band who are going with me? Every time you'll be confessing. They will even tell you to kneel down. Then you will kneel down and say, confess your sin first. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ate more rice than I should have eaten. I took meat in the pot. I'm sorry. Okay, both the one I commit and the one I didn't commit, I'm sorry. <laughs> then after that, they will now say, you can now pray because you have clear road by confessing your sin. What a wicked way to teach somebody relationship with God. How many of you want to have a relationship with your wife every day before she talks to you, she will confess? Honey, I'm about to say good morning, but before good morning, I snored when I was sleeping. I'm sorry. <laughs> How many of you want that kind of marriage where every time you want to talk, the first thing is confession? If you don't like it as a human being, how do you think God likes it? Father, I'm sorry. Uh -uh. I'm, a husband that apologizes all the time will get the wife tired. You can't be apologizing all the time. It makes you a coward. It makes you a weakling. It makes you unattractive. You think God is excited about you confessing? Your confession makes God wonder whether you know what you're doing or not. So I'm saying, Dr. Damien, are you saying that even if I sin, I shouldn't confess? What value is confessing? You have already done it. You have already done it. Will confession undo it? So what do I do when I do wrong? Stand up and remind yourself who you are. Stand up and say, no, I'm bigger than that. It will never happen again. Thank you, Lord. That's what the prodigal son did. He said, what? How many hired servants does my father have enough to eat and to spare? Why am I suffering here? I will go back to my father. Father, father. I have seen against heaven and against earth. Before he could start listening, the father said, go and get my robe, get my gown, get my shoe. My son. He didn't say prodigal. He said my son. His translators that added prodigal on top. It's not the father that called him prodigal. I'm teaching good. We don't confess sin. We confess Christ. Because Christ is our sin bearer. I'm teaching good. Now, so if all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, now keep that verse somewhere. Keep it somewhere. Are you keeping it? Romans chapter 5, verse 12. I'm going to show you something now. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so, death passed upon all men. Death passed. Death passed. Okay, this one has changed it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Emphatic. Now, he, no, no more emphatic. Death passed. So the mindset this verse now is telling you is that it's as if death is a person that is traveling. So he came to your house. And then, whether you agree or not, 
after he finished with you, he passed to this house. He passed to this house. So it's not automatic. That means de death related with each person. And how you handled it determined whether it stayed in your house or not. So it kept passing. Which means sin, the sin of Adam was not automatic. You are not a sinner because Adam sinned. That will be injustice. Because I wasn't even there when he sinned. I didn't contribute. So why should his sin automatically be put on me? That would be injustice. At least I should be given a fair chance to make my own choice. Just like he too was given a fair chance to make his own choice. If I'm teaching, say I hear you. Please reason with me. Next verse. Verse 13. Listen carefully. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not logizomide. The word imputed is a Greek word logizomai. It's a, an accounting term. Like accrediting something into an account. Like when I put money in your account, you get bank alert, which shows you your balance. That's logizomai. So, sin was in the world, but sin was not credited in men's accounts, even though they were sinning. But they were not held accountable for sin. Why? When there is no law. So, it appears to me that until the law of Moses was introduced, people got away with sin. Because first of all, they didn't even know what sin was. You are not understanding. They didn't know because there's no law. Look, until there's traffic light, there will be nothing like traffic offense. It is traffic light that creates the law for traffic offense. If I'm driving past Pastor Daddy Ken with speed and driving past, I've not made an offense. But once you put a traffic light by Pastor Daddy Ken and it is red and I drive and pass like before, what will it be? Traffic offense. What brought the offense? The law. So it's the arrival of the law of Moses that defines sin. Observe, next verse, 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. You are not seeing this. Okay. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them. Wait, wait, wait. Even over them that have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So there are those who did not commit Adam's sin. Yes, sir. That means it's not everybody that received Adam's sin, which means that Adam's sin is not automatic. Because there are those who had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Observe, who is the figure, the pattern of him? That word him in the original is not him, is sin. Adam is the figure of sin that was to come. Adam is the figure, the pattern. And there are those who did not sin after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Okay? Back to Romans 3.23, where we came from. Romans 3.23. Can we all read again? For all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. So, if there are those who didn't sin after the, the similitude of Adam's transgression, this one says all. So, what is this all I've seen? Pretext, post-text will explain context. So, look at the, the verse before. Let's start from verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned, next verse, and come short of the glory of God. Next verse. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Next verse. Whom God has set forth. So, we have still not gotten what made all sin. So, which means we need to go back to verse 20. 20. Therefore, 
by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Next verse. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophet. Next verse. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, upon all, um, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Next verse. For all have sinned. So, no flesh is justified by the law. So, by the law, all have sinned. So, it is the law that have declared all sinners. Not the sin of Adam. Is it getting clear? Now so, Dr. Damina, what are you saying? When babies are born, are they born sinners? Huh? Okay. Stay with me because what we're dealing with here is a very fundamental issue of salvation. Let me ask all of you a question. When Adam was created by God, was he created a sinner? How was he created? Innocent. He was neither a sinner or a non-sinner. He was innocent waiting to be tested. Eh? Anybody can claim not to be a thief. Until the day they lock you inside a bullion van with money. And you come out and everything is intact. I'm teaching good. Adam was born how? Innocent. Until choice. He now became corrupt. So if Adam was born innocent or created innocent, how are babies born? Innocent. Somebody will say, what about the sin of their fathers? What about the sin of their mother? Ezekiel 18 verse 1. Ezekiel 18 verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, next verse, What mean ye that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. It is the fathers that eat. It is the children that are feeling the, the sourness of what the fathers ate. That's what they call generational cause. What fathers did, children are suffering it. Okay? Family patterns. Generational cause. Okay? So he now says, why are you using this proverb? Why are preachers preaching this gospel? God is surprised. God is surprised. Ah, uh -uh. Where are you getting this message from? Where did you get generational cause from? What mean ye that you are using this proverb? Why are you talking like that? Look at the next verse. Oh, I love this. As I live, say the Lord. You shall no more have occasion to use this proverb in Israel. Why? Next verse. Next verse. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the father, so also is the soul of the son is mine. The soul that seen it. So if the father has sinned, the father will die the death. It will not transfer to the child. Somebody shout, no more. No. Now this is God talking. He said it cannot happen. It's injustice. A father will carry everything he has done to his grave. The child will start a clean slate. Sit down, let me show you some letters. Somebody said, but the Bible says in Deuteronomy that God said he will punish in Exodus, that God said he will punish the sin of the fathers today. Put it up! Exodus chapter 20 verse 5. <laughs> Put it up for me. Exodus 20 verse 5. Teto letete. 
Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I the Lord, observe, observe. For I the Lord am a jealous God. Visiting. Now that word jealous has to be well explained. Because if God is jealous, then God has works of the flesh. Because jealousy is a work of the flesh. And if God is jealous, it means me and God were in the same class. That means God has no moral right to judge me for jealousy. So God cannot be jealous. Jealous means God is eyeing somebody. God can be jealous. So it's use of word. Because when the Bible was translated, there was limited vocabulary. So the best vocabulary that could express that as at that time was jealous. But with better English today, that word jealous is not jealous. That word jealous is a word for like, I am passionate. Like, I love you so much that I am protective. It's not like jealousy. Eh? Because love is not jealous. And God is love. So it has to be explained. Okay? Now, observe. For I, the Lord that God, am a jealous God. The word visiting has to be explained. Because that's the word they use in those funny churches to punish people seriously. Say, God will visit you to the third and fourth generation. Eh, eh. The word visiting in the Hebrew means I will take care of. Yes. It means I will take care of. Visiting in the Hebrew. Taking care of the iniquity of the fathers. He said, I will take care of the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, unto the third and fourth for generation of them that hate me. That means, if you hate me, I will make sure by taking care of your children's children's children, your hatred does not transfer. That's the meaning of the word visit. It's not visit like I am going to visit you. Uh -uh. Don't use English dictionary for Bible. The word visit means I wait. I need to be born again. Are you following? That means when children are born, they are born how? Alive to who? To God. But when they come to the age of accountability, where they know right and wrong, that is where they die. But some of them don't even die. At the point of accountability, they receive Christ. Bam! So they never experience death. They came from alive to life. That's why we get children born again early. Once your children begin to know how to speak English, start showing them Christ so that they never taste death. Teaching good? Now, sit down. Let me talk a little more. So, the question now will be, if they die, where do they go? Babies. They are alive now. So, where do you think they will go? They go to Jesus. Every baby that died, whether by abortion, miscarriage, died at babyhood, even child, even children that died without knowing they are left from their right. All of them are with Jesus. Somebody says, how do you prove that further? I have too much corroboration to give you. Jesus said clearly, suffer the little children to come unto me for of such he didn't say suffer the Christian children. He said suffer the little children. Because that is, they are of the kingdom. Finally, there is compassion with justice. There's compassion with justice. So that is where even those that are deaf and dumb will be handled at. Deaf and dumb will be handled like babies. Because they can't hear. They can't speak. 
So they are treated as innocent. Mentally deranged will be treated as babies. Because their head can't even think. So when they die, they are going to Jesus. Because there's compassion with justice. I'm teaching good. Somebody said, Dr. David, I proof for that. Jonah. Jonah. <laughs> you remember Joe? Jonah. You know Jonah. You don't know Jonah. He ran away. Finally, he arrived in Nineveh and came out of the belly of a fish with his suitcase. And the people say, let's celebrate the man of God, the general of our time, who has been able to miraculously use a fish to arrive. No man can do these things. <laughs> Immediately Jonah came into Nineveh, he began to prophesy, 40 days, Nineveh shall be destroyed. But children and animals destroyed. If I be a man of God, 40 days only. Then the king of Nineveh threw a fast and asked animals to fast. Children, babies, everybody was fasting. You can imagine children crying for hunger that they cannot explain why they are suffering. <laughs> babies on breast milk, the mother suspended it. Everybody fasting. Animals were meh, meh, coo, 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 all over the land because of a prophet. <laughs> no prophet, no prophet. Lie. After 40 days, nothing happened. Say, Jonah got angry. God, you see you. Jonah said, God, you know I don't trust you. That is why when you sent me to Nineveh, I refused to go. Because I know you. I don't trust you. You are too merciful. So Jonah knew that God is merciful. Look at that Jonah. Let's read it. Jonah 4, 1 to 4. Quickly, quickly. And I'll, I'll round up there. Are you blessed? If I close now, have I arrived? Have I taken you to a place where we can stop? Very good, very good. But he displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. The prophet is angry. They, they, they do a conference. When the prophet is angry. <laughs> and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was this not my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tashish. For I knew, I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. Jonah said, God, you did change mind. That's not true. God doesn't change his mind. But that was Jonah's assumption. Because he was speaking out of anger. So he spoke God's character and added to it from anger. Okay? Next verse. Therefore now, O Lord, take and beseech thee my life from me. Kill me! Because he knows God will not kill him. <laughs> you know, if you know that God will not do something, you'll be telling God, okay, now that I have done number 15 of this thing, I say I will not do, kill me the next one I do, because you know he will not kill you. After the next one, I say, Father, you know, I was just talking like a fool. Forgive me. Because you know he won't kill you. Jonah said, take away my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. Why? Because his prophecy has not come to pass. Now animals are looking at him and say, Prophet Jonah, we... <laughs> Chicky will come around you and do go, 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 go. <laughs> we were punished on your account. Alpha. <laughs> Judah says, It's better for me to die than to live. Verse 4. Verse 4. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? 
Jonah. Ah, ah. Look at children. Look at animals. Look at innocent people. Jonah, you want me to wipe away this town just to satisfy your pride? Hey, Jonah, be coming down. This is even before Jesus died, though. So you won't say it is because Jesus died that God is merciful. That has been his character. Look at the next verse, verse, verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. And there made him a boot and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what will become of the city. The prophet now is watching to see his prophecy come to pass. <laughs> next verse. And the Lord God prepared a God and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head. God is calming him down with kindness. God is putting shadow to cool him down from sunshine. To deliver him from his grief. Isn't God a good God? <laughs> so Jonah was exceeding glad of the God. Next verse. But God prepared a worm now you can see the assumption of the prophet. So now he believed that it is God that prepared a worm. How can God be the one to prepare the house and pull it down? But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the God that it withered. Next verse. And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah. <laughs> That he fainted. <laughs> Man of God, don't die for pulpit. <laughs> Jonah fainted <laughs> and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. See, pride. Next verse. And God said to Jonah, Do is thou well to be angry for the God? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Now he's trying to provoke God. Can you see Jonah? Man of God. <laughs> Next verse. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the God. For the which thou hast not labored, neither made it to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. God is telling him, I'm not the one that destroyed it all. Even though you say I'm the one, but I'm not the one. God is explaining himself. Next verse. And should not I spare Nineveh? Now God is reasoning. Now you can see the sense of how God treats children. Should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six court thousand persons, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. And also much cattle. How about Jonah? Eh? Jonah, they are over, there are more than six court thousand persons who don't know their left from their right. They can't even make a decision. He's talking about children. Are you following? These are not Christian children. These are children. Next verse. Is that the end of that chapter? So, what God is simply saying is that when it comes to judgment, God has justice with compassion. And God's compassion covers children. God does. So, you know, when I was a little boy, they used to teach us one stupid song. I don't know if you still teach children those songs. If you do good, kingdom, oh, kingdom, oh, kingdom, waiting for you. If you do bad, no more kingdom, oh. You know why I'm doing like this? That's how the teacher used to be doing me. No more kingdom, oh, no more kingdom, oh, no more kingdom waiting for you. So they gave us a mentality that it is good that will take you to heaven. Bad will take you to hell. And they taught us that as little children. Then there's one they will say, are you in the lost army? Yes, sir. <laughs> 
I will never. I will never. I am in the lost army. Yes, sir. <laughs> that he can this your church. Eh? <laughs> they don't carry us go Sunday school. <laughs> Then they will tell the child for stealing meat in the pot or you kneel down. Sing the lost army. The boy will kneel down. <laughs> I will never. He's kneeling down because he took meat from the pot. So as the boy is singing, he's wondering, come on, meat. Now in God they punish me like this. <laughs> come on, meat, where I carry. Now in God they punish me like this. Kai, this God must be very wicked though. Just me too. I know steal the pot. Now meat. One meat. So you are trained from a baby to begin to see God as a wicked person. And that's wrong. You don't do that to your children. You don't do that to your children. So a mindset is already given to children that is contrary to God's character. And as parents, we must stop doing that. Don't threaten your children with Bible. When they do something wrong, say, oh yeah, go ahead, carry your Bible. Open John chapter 1, read chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6. Me, me, why you the mother? You never read chapter 1 before. <laughs> me, why you and that baby, if you don't have Jesus and two of you die, the baby will be in heaven. Now you go go hell. Let's not threaten our children. Let's bring them down with love. It is love that leads people to repentance. When you love people, love has a way of winning people. Somebody say, I hear you. Did I answer that question? So if I ask you now emphatically, are children born sinners? When children die, where do they go? Exactly, it's very clear. Very clear. Do babies come from heaven? Where do babies come from? What process? Procreation. A law we are in Genesis. Clearly, once you give that answer, you have clarity. And then nobody now will blame God for things that go wrong in people's lives. Because you have seen that God has handed over the planet to man. Whatever man makes out of the planet will be his, his own doing. But let me ask you one last question before I pray for you. What part does God play? Eh? Miracles, what else? Mercy, what else? Salvation. When there's problem and things are rough and God comes in, what he does is to save, to deliver, to protect, to create miracles. Because God is a good God. Every good and perfect gift coming from above. Glory to God. Stand on your feet. Shout glory. Are you blessed? Well, stand on your feet. That's the end of this conference, this, this, this season. If you've been blessed, shout bless. If somebody is still sitting down, help them to stand up. Help them to stand up. Help them. Some of them may need some help. Some of them, the team don't enter well, well. They are looking for how to stand. But is God a good God? Is he a loving father? Is he a gracious father? Say with me, I commit myself to the study of God's word. Both in church and in my private life. I declare there is so much to God I need to discover. So I commit myself to study the word. I will attend to the word. I will pay attention to the word. So I can grow and be a blessing to my generation. I didn't hear your amen. amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice in this service online, on television, those that are listening by way of radio, and everybody standing in this building right now. I decree and declare right now that the revelation of God's word grows big on your inside until nothing else matters. Barriers are terminated. Obstacles are destroyed. In the name of Jesus. I decree that you walk out of this place taking authority over your world. You rule over circumstances. You rule over situations. 
you rule over devils and demons in the name of Jesus those of you that were deceived to think that the reason why things are not working is because of things that has happened in your family from this day I declare that your mindset is corrected therefore take responsibility for your life I decree that you have the wisdom of God to make right choices and those of you that have walked into things that are making life difficult for you receive deliverance receive the salvation of God I declare things to turn around turn around in the name of Jesus sick bodies be healed disease be dissolved favor be released I decree that the work of your hands are blessed your marriage is blessed any marriage here that is going through turbulence and crisis right now I command those turbulence and crisis dissolved dissolved receive the peace of God in your home I decree that your children will grow up under the influence of the Holy Ghost single guys and single ladies that are in the process of making decisions for marriage receive clarity of understanding in the name of Jesus Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. And thank you for the blessing upon the refined people's assembly and Yenegua as a state. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Well, can we give the Lord a celebration for this conference and a shout for every good thing that has happened this week? Glory! 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 Now listen to me, I want to take up your offerings quickly. We want to give and support the conference, support Pastor Daddy Ken and the leadership of this church so that all the bills are paid, the whole conference is paid for. So that the next time I'm coming, your pastor will not go like, ah, uh, budget. Make it easy for him to do ministry. Let's support the house, let's give. Some of you can give 100,000, 50,000, 250,000, 200,000, 1 million. If you can do it, why not? Be a blessing to the work of God. Let's give and support the conference. Amen. I said amen. amen. There are banking details on the screen. If you are making a check, make it out in the name of this house. And then I want to pray as we give this morning joyfully and as we give excitedly. Praise God. You know, uh, if you have questions that I have not answered, ask Pastor Daddy Ken. If there's any scripture you didn't understand the explanation, ask Pastor Daddy Ken. If there's anything I said you didn't understand what I said, ask Pastor Daddy Ken. Amen. Go to your pastor. I leave the rest of the work for him. Because I know he can do it very well. Amen. Amen. And make sure you get the books. Get my books. Get my books and begin to read them. They will help you a lot with clarity. Lift up your offerings. Father, we give in faith. We give with joy. Everyone giving the blessing is upon our finances. And I decree that in this church, we lack nothing. All the supplies we need are released right now financial miracles for your people and favors for your people and we rejoice that our offerings are a sweet smell before you today in jesus precious name and every believer says a powerful amen. amen now wait 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 i have a song i want you guys to sing as we take this offering oh, oh, oh. as you leave this conference everywhere you go just make heaven on it Make it available everywhere. In your marriage, heaven on it. In your business, heaven on it. Here it is, do we go punish the devil? <laughs>